Hi everyone, this is GKCS. In this video, we'll be talking about 20 white papers that you must know as a backend engineer, especially if you're in a senior engineering position or staff level position. Uh, the benefit of reading a white paper is that you get to know the implementation details and the practical aspects of building systems. So most of the trade-offs that are chosen when building a system come from the product requirements of the system. In the case of these white papers, the product requirements are being decided by other engineers who will be using that system. For example, you have the system at Meta, which is called Memcached. Right? It's an open source software, uh, which Facebook has modified for their own use. One of the problems they were facing was scaling. So they need to deploy many nodes of Memcached. Apart from the challenges of routing, one thing which came up was, should you choose sharding over redundancy? Sharding basically means you have a key space and that key space is divided into sets. Uh, each set is given to a set of servers and redundancy means that you have the same key space being handled by multiple servers simultaneously. The problem here with multiple servers is that they may be eventually consistent and also the cost of managing multiple servers for a small key space. As you see this problem is not as big as the other problem of sharding for Facebook because they had a concept of aggregate queries. So when a client request would come for let's say the profile, the profile also had friend connections it also had likes on a post, a news feed. So it was a complex query hitting multiple shards. And so splitting the key space would have only made things worse for them. So this is an example of one trade-off. Each of the papers that I'm going to be talking about are really interesting and you should have a look. So let's start. Number 20, Monolith. This is a real-time recommendation system white paper. This is from TikTok. Their engineers have found a way to give recommendations to millions of users in real time. So one of the problems with any recommendation algorithm is you have a set of users, you have a real-time component to it and a batch component to it, but the recommendations in the real-time section are not very good. Monolith found a way to embed features of users, right? The basic idea here would be that Gaurav likes to watch, let's say, chess videos. Uh, and a person who likes to watch chess videos may also like to program. So an embedding can be thought of as a point in a n-dimensional space. Gaurav has a particular age, so that is the x-axis, Gaurav is a male, that's the y-axis, Gaurav is from India, that's on the z-axis, uh, like I said, he likes watching chess videos, so probability of watching chess video may be a alpha axis, and so on, you have n dimensions. In this, Gaurav is a point, and people who are close to him usually tend to watch the same things. How do you efficiently embed Gaurav in a space and also give him recommendations is a serious problem in many of these useless newsfeed <laughs> applications. So um, as an engineer, it makes sense to look at the kind of scale that you're dealing with. 19, FlexiRaft. This is a paper by Meta. It's a very interesting paper because when you look at the Raft algorithm, you have this concept of quorum where a majority of the nodes agree on a particular value. Uh, the problem with this is scalability. If you add more and more nodes, a majority of those nodes have to agree on a value. It's not easy to do and also it doesn't make sense when you have a globally distributed system. The Indian servers have to agree to the US server's value. Uh, maybe the Europe servers also have to come in. So a global system of quorum is not what you're looking for. You're looking for a tree-like structure where the Indians agree on a particular value and they have a leader who talks to the leader of the US, who talks to the leader of Europe. This tree hierarchy also needs to be roughly consistent. So Facebook has come up with this algorithm called FlexiRaft. It's really interesting to look at. I think it will also give you an idea of how Raft works internally or if you are really into it, Paxos, we have discussed that in interview ready also. Pretty useful to know how distributed consensus works. Number 18 is Spanner. Spanner is also around distributed consensus, but it's around how a database can work, how it can give you strong consistency guarantees, how it can offer transactions. And Spanner is a very popular example for a geo-distributed database, which is strongly consistent and also highly available. Google has spent millions of dollars making sure that their clocks are all in sync and it's a feat of engineering which is worth looking at. Spanner is expected to survive the worst of faults. Even if things are on fire, there's an expectation that Spanner is going to be up. So it's good to look at what kind of fault tolerant mechanisms Google has employed. Number 17, Minesweeper. Minesweeper is again meta. It's a root cause analysis system. You can imagine this to be something which identifies what caused a problem. So you have anomaly detection. If you have any kind of a smooth graph, if it's a straight line, one differentiation will make it flat. If it's a parabola, two differentiations will make it flat. But if it's not, if it's a very complex graph with anomalies, three differentiations will show you all the problem points. Okay, and you can catch them 
and say that these are anomalies. Once you have detected these anomalies, how do you identify what caused the anomaly? You are probably going to look at factors which are highly correlated to the graph that you are looking at. A change in the contributing factor is probably what has caused the final change that you are seeing in your business metrics. If you see sales are low, but actually what has really happened is landings on the website are low. Then you should probably focus on the landings instead of trying to fix sales. Minesweeper is an automated system. It's really interesting to think about how much automation can help you. For a startup, of course, it doesn't really make sense because you can do this manually. But in medium to large organizations, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Number 16, Cassandra. Cassandra is an extremely popular database. It talks about how the database uses a cluster architecture, the gossip protocol, how it chooses certain trade-offs like consistency or availability. However, frankly speaking, it did give me vibes that, you know, it's an open source clone of Amazon DynamoDB. It's totally fine. I mean, I totally understand open source technologies are very important. It's important to have these possible solutions for us small companies to leverage. But as a white paper, yes, uh, it probably is not the world's best white paper. Having said that, as an engineer, it's worth reading. Number 15, Foundation DB. Foundation DB is really interesting because the kind of testing techniques that they have employed to make sure that their transactions work in this NoSQL database are novel. Right? There's talks also on Foundation DB. Another thing is that it's a key value data store, so that's the most popular kind of data store when it comes to NoSQL databases. And it's worth a read when it comes to highly consistent systems which are also scalable. And it's a paper by Apple, so there's some <laughs> diversity in these white papers. Number 14, Amazon Aurora. Aurora is more like an architecture pattern that Amazon uses when it comes to managing databases. So the key factors here are scale. Amazon wants to scale enormously and they also want to give you very high availability. So how do they ensure that? How do they add and remove nodes seamlessly? How do they also hide the complexity of Aurora from their clients? You want to give some sort of customizability, but you also don't want startups to break their heads while using your system. So it's an interesting set of trade-offs that they have picked up in this paper and it's definitely worth reading. Number 13, Pregel. Pregel is a system by Google. Uh, this is a graph processing system. It's not necessarily maintaining graphs, but finding patterns in graphs. So page ranking algorithms, uh, finding out interesting websites, ranking those websites, all of this is usually done in batch. It's a very old system by Google, uh, which gives a good idea of how it probably works behind the scenes. Once you know this, you might have a decent idea of how SEO works for Google. In fact, some of the aspects for the Pregel paper are very practical. So it makes sense as an engineer to read this quite well. Number 12, Dapper. Dapper is another system by Google. It's a tracing system. If you have a request which is going through possibly hundreds of services, then it's very difficult to trace that request to find out what happened at what point in time. Dapper is probably the first step when it comes to root cause analysis. For example, you probably can't take all requests. You want to do some sort of sampling of requests. You don't want to log every line of the request. You want some points which when reached trigger an event and say that, okay, this thing happened to this request. Okay, especially at scale, it doesn't make sense to log everything. Uh, one interesting thing about Dapper is that whenever a system tries to integrate this service, engineers at Dapper check whether you are hitting it the right way because you shouldn't be impacting the rest of the services at Google. So it's not just code reviews now, it's actually inter-system code reviews. Number 11, Chubby. Chubby is a system very similar to Apache Zookeeper. Google came up with this system for distributed locks and that's a fundamental component of any kind of transaction or uh, any kind of lead election that you have. Internally it employs Paxos but the paper doesn't talk about Paxos anywhere. Instead it focuses on the practical aspects of implementing such a large scale distributed locking system. For example, what do you do? You probably use a file system to manage the locks. You need some sort of notifications to be sent whenever a lock is held or released. If you want a high level understanding of Paxos, Interview Ready has a lesson on that. 10. Megastore. Megastore is a data store at Google which provides relational database semantics. So Google usually goes for NoSQL. But Megastore is a highly scalable, highly reliable system which gives you asset transactions and also an RDBMS like feel. It's interesting to look at what kind of trade-offs they have made here again and also how they have tested the system, how they make sure that what they have built actually works uh, in such a large environment. What I found interesting was that internally Megastore uses Bigtable, which is a NoSQL data store. How do you map RDBMS to a NoSQL data store? It makes you feel like how databases actually work. You have a very simple, let's say, hardware system or a file system which is backing all of your data. 
even in a database. So how do you build relational data on top of something which doesn't provide you that? Right? How do you build indexes? So Megastore is definitely worth it. Number nine, Bigtable. Bigtable is a fundamental database solution for Google. It's a NoSQL data store. It's actually something which powers many of the systems in Google, including I think the search engine. You have multiple versions of the data that can be stored. So if you have an older version of a page and then you have a newer version of the page, you can have all of that in one data store called Bigtable. Many of the principles of Bigtable, like hot shards and keeping multiple shards consistent is now considered common practice. But when it was made, it was a really big deal. Uh, and of course, the ideas are very intelligent. It's a very practical database solution that Google came up with uh, at a time when NoSQL was not a very common solution. Number eight, MapReduce. The MapReduce architecture is one of the most important core architecture pieces that any data engineer or software engineer can look at. Uh, as the system scale, you have various services storing data and this data needs to be processed for analytics reasons, recommendations, sometimes just for storage archival. How do you do this efficiently with commodity hardware? More than a decade ago, when Google came up with the solution of MapReduce, it was extremely novel and very intelligent. In fact, immediately open source solutions started coming out uh, using this kind of an architecture, which is absolutely amazing. If you have seen Apache Spark or Apache Hadoop, they end up using MapReduce or some variation of it internally. It's a must read for engineers. You should know about this architecture because some of the concepts are in fact now used also in programming languages. Java has this concept of mapping, filtering, reducing, and at interview ready, we have explained this architecture in detail. Number eight, Google file system. This is probably the world's most popular technical white paper uh, when it comes to software engineers. Google file system is a way in which Google stores data. It doesn't necessarily need to be file data. Bigtable, for example, uses Google file system. So it forms a basic layer on top of other high level systems. And for Google, I'm sure it makes a lot of sense to build their own file system. Hadoop file system is something you might have heard of. There are tremendous similarities when it comes to Hadoop and Google. Google came out first and I think Hadoop has taken inspiration again, which is totally again, like I said, fine. You, you need open source alternatives and solutions for your own systems. But the original paper is very well written. Uh, it's very easily understandable and the trade-offs which are made to ensure that this file system is consistent and performant uh, makes a lot of sense. It's a must read for engineers. Number six, Tau. T-A-O or Tau uh, from Meta is a very interesting system which is basically an in-memory graph database. For Meta, it makes a lot of sense to have an in-memory graph database because they have the social network that they want to pass. To map this information, you could use relational databases, you could use NoSQL databases, you can try to hack your way through through adjacency lists, but none of them really work at scale. So instead they have a dedicated in-memory graph database called Tau uh, and some of the practical considerations when it comes to keeping this data consistent and highly available uh, are absolutely amazing. Tau is I think an engineering marvel and you should as an engineer definitely read up on it. Number five, Memcached. Memcached is an amazing solution by Facebook. The best part about this is the practicality of their decisions. I think we touched on this earlier, but there's a ton of trade-offs and a ton of optimizations that Facebook has made on Memcached. Should you use TCP or UDP? Well, it depends on the situation. Should you go for sharding or replication? Like we said, it depends on the situation. Here they chose replication. So there's a ton of trade-offs, a ton of practical applications that Memcached at Facebook has, and the white paper is definitely worth it. It's probably the top five papers uh, that you can look at. Number four, Monarch. Google Monarch is a time series database. The reason why I'm mentioning this so high up is because Monarch is again, a very practical database. It's something that Google uses at scale with very high reliability to monitor their systems. Monarch is expected to run even if all the other systems have gone down, including their database. If the database is down, Monarch is supposed to say, hey, the database has gone down. Now, how do you do that, uh, right? Because to some extent, you are going to be tracking your patterns and anomalies through database graphs. So you have to keep everything in memory. And as a time series database at Google scale, that's a ton of memory, that's in petabytes. The white paper is absolutely amazing. It's definitely worth a read. Number three, GorillaDB. GorillaDB is not a database, uh, it's an in-memory database. You can call it a cache uh, and it's a time series database. Facebook again does something similar to Monarch. In fact, you'll see them come up with the same logical conclusions. Both companies, Google and Facebook, created their own time series database, Monarch and Gorilla. And then eventually they say that we are going to be doing something different. So Facebook says the recently timed events are the most important ones. 
and Google says, I'm not going to make that assumption. And because of that, they have trade-offs. They make architectural decisions which are different. Right? But Facebook for me, I'm, I find them really interesting in the sense that they, they choose performance very often, they choose practicality very often. For a startup, it, it makes more sense or they resonate more with me. So their white paper was a personal preference, I think. Monarch is of course, uh, engineering wise, more of a marble, I would say. But yeah. Gorilla is definitely worth reading. Behind the scenes, it uses OpenTSDB, so it kind of cheats on the persistence side. It's in the top three papers that I would go for. Number two, Amazon DynamoDB. Uh, this is a very popular database solution by Amazon. In fact, I think it propelled their engineering feats. Complex algorithms, like research level algorithms when it comes to Merkle trees to make sure that data is moved from one place to another. Uh, consistent hashing and all of this actually implemented. Uh, DynamoDB has extremely high levels of availability. It's very performant. Its consistency is also pretty amazing and it's a solution that is offered by AWS to everybody in the world. It's one of the most impactful papers in the world so it's worth looking into. Number one, Zanzibar. This is a system by Google. It's been open sourced now. The reason I'm mentioning Zanzibar on top as the best paper probably that you can read, there are so many practical optimizations made by Google to make sure that their authentication system runs efficiently. The algorithm for authentication, you know, the, the data schema or the APIs is just hardly one page. That's the idea, that's the concept. Then comes optimization on optimization on optimization. And I'm like really impressed by Google that they made this open source that you can actually use this. 90% uh, you probably either won't need it or you can just go to GCP, which probably uses it internally. You don't really need to build it, but the aspects around rate limiting, the aspects around fault tolerance when it comes to Zanzibar are absolutely mind blowing. Some of these concepts I had explained at Interview Ready in the rate limiting chapter, the first one, and then I got to see that Zanzibar is implementing them in reality and at scale, right? So it's interesting to see how theory meets practicality. But when you're at, let's say, a billion users making billions of requests per day, it's definitely worth a read for every engineer. Do check it out. So that's all I have for the white papers that you should read as a software engineer. The papers are neatly organized and put in one blog post. The link is in the description. Do check it out. Let me know what white papers you like with a short description of why you like it. Maybe you know it talks about trade-offs, practicality, the scale, the ease of understanding the paper. And if you found something particularly interesting, we can actually have a discussion on them in the comments below. Until next time, I'll see you. Bye-bye.